So hello and welcome to our talk today entitled AFRIVIPE, which stands for Africa Virtual Interprofessional Education. My name is Mary Shostark. I'm an assistant professor at the Yale School of Medicine Physician Assistant Online. So today we will be speaking to you um, about a few session objectives. We'll describe the components of a successful and pedagogically progressive virtual interprofessional education activities. We'll describe the international collaboration required to develop and host a large format IPE like AFRIVIPE. And we'll consider the institutional resource faculty and student factors in, uh, involved in developing an activity like AFRIVIPE. So take you to the next slide. So I'm just going to give you a brief background on where AFRIVIPE started. Um, AFRIVIPE originated from VIPE, which is the Virtual Interprofessional Education Collaborative. Um, VIPE is a collaborative of several universities in the United States, uh, Yale uh, University, uh, New York University, University of Southern California, uh, GW, and Georgetown uh, University, who initially came together in 2017 to form a committee out of the need to give their students an interprofessional experience. All of our programs are online and were intentionally designed to be online pre-COVID. Uh, initially, um, I went out uh, to reach out to the schools and asked if they would want to be part of our interprofessional IPE committee. Uh, we recognized that we all had a shared interest in IPE and volunteered to be part of this committee. Uh, we hosted our first virtual interprofessional education uh, session in 2018, giving students uh, asynchronous content and synchronous content opportunities to participate in IPE activities. We were accepted then to present at the second uh, IPE and collaborative practice for Africa in, to, in summer of 2019 in Nairobi, um, Kenya. From there, many conference attendees came up to us after the presentation and expressed an interest in creating a similar initiative throughout Africa. From there, we created the following committee. And you can see that we have many members of our committee and several of these members are here today to present with us and they will be introducing themselves shortly. And there's our other set of committee members. And our next, uh, Andy. Yeah, hi there. My name is Andrew Wiss, and I'm with the Department of Health Policy and Management at the George Washington University's Milken Institute School of Public Health in the United States. And I'd like to talk with you a little bit about our pedagogical model for running online IPE and what it takes to build one of these out. So first off, um, this really is a community and a sweat equity effort, meaning that um, representatives from each one of the institutions that are participating, in this case, well over 20, um, came together for monthly and then closer to the event bi-weekly meetings to plan the curriculum, to talk about logistics, not just within institution or within inter-institutional within country, but globally across all these, these different institutions to, to deal with different logistical factors. Um, those monthly meetings were also a place where we came together to share our individual expertise in our disciplines and build a special case, uh, place into these case activities for our students to contribute their knowledge and the skills that, that we're having them develop within our programs. Um, and that all gets back to really just being design oriented. We're, we're very curricularly focused, which means we start with objectives. Um, we utilize the IPEC competencies as a foundation for the, the design of these activities. Um, and those objectives that we select end up informing the design and all of the operational components of, of these activities as, as we move forward. So um, you can imagine that coordinating this number of students, um, I think for our first event, we had, we had nearly 500. Is, is that correct, Mary? Uh, yes, we'll talk, oh, we'll talk about that shortly. Sorry. Sorry. I, don't mean to, I don't mean to jump ahead, um, but I'm just going to slide back Slide. Um, so anyways, we're dealing with a large number of students from, from large number of countries. There's a, there's a lot that goes into planning the timeline of the event and making sure everyone's able to make it you know, on time um, and, and able to attend. Um, the timeline of event um, gets planned between committee members. Um, and we also, in those meetings, discuss, discuss key deliverables. Uh, it's important to note now that these VIPE activities, these virtual interprofessional education activities that we've designed, utilize an online flipped model 
meaning that our students um, go through a good deal of asynchronous content that we'll describe in a little bit, individual learning and preparation to come together as a larger group um, in, in many hundreds and then into smaller breakout groups. So it's all very intentionally designed using a more progressive online pedagogy and an online flipped model. Uh, we think that um, like much of the, the IPE community right now, that there's a dearth of research on, on what it means to collaborate and be great interprofessional collaborators. And because of that, research is an important component of what we're doing. And we build some research component in each one of these activities. So IRB approval um, across multiple institutions um, can always be a challenge, but um, it, was, it was a unique challenge for us because we also needed to take into account international um, components as well. Different countries have different, different, um, different regulations and responsibilities that they, they ascribe to, uh, to PIs. Um, in terms of roles and responsibilities, again, this is a sweat equity effort, meaning that those of us that were most capable to handle certain parts of the design, the build out of curriculum, um, we took that on. Um, we're, we're all um, natural interprofessional collaborators. Um, and, and that's really how the job got done in this activity got designed. Um, in terms of case creation, um, Again, we, we, we really did um, solicit as much as we could from each one of the professions to make sure that there was a good and meaningful place for each one of our students from the different professions to um, participate. And finally, um, wonderful work done just on scripting for the case and also the video component that added a further human dimension. Um, I don't want to steal too much thunder for those that explain each one of these components, so I'm going to stop now. And so Hanley? Good afternoon. My name is Andy Pito. I'm an occupational therapy lecturer at Safal Kumagat University in Pretoria, South Africa. An authentic African case study was developed. The case study needs to be complex and showcase each profession's contribution. Participants received the case study of Patricia in advance, and it contained detailed information about her background and symptoms. Just to give you a bit of an idea, she's pregnant, suffers from diabetes, hypertension, and consulted for an STD. She cannot walk due to a leg infection and she lost her job due to COVID. So what we did is we made a video to accompany the case study. It portrayed a standardized patient interviewed in a shack in the community by two health professionals. You can see in the video below. The video added reality and authenticity. It also gave students who were not familiar with the type of setting an idea of her home circumstances and challenges. Through the case study, the students became more aware that one person cannot be knowledgeable about all aspects of the patient's condition and that team members need to collaborate for optimal care. Thank you. Thank you. Cool. All right, Ren uh, Renee. All right, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Renee Caveza. I work at the School of Health Sciences at Stockton University in the United States. Um, there were many moving parts that came together to create our AfroVipe event. Committee members reached out to their students at their respective institutions and gathered their names and emails addresses, some using a Google form sign up. Um, students were then sent informed consent via Qualtrics, um, which is an online survey tool. And once that was completed, they were re redirected to a university webpage, which actually housed all the asynchronous materials that were laid out step by steps for how students um, could prepare for the event. The first and most important step for this was to register for the Zoom meeting. Um, this provided students with individualized links so that sorting them into their groups later would be easier. Um, then basic information of the event was listed on the page, such as the goals, objectives, and, and an agenda. Um, the next step had an attached uh, Qualtrics links for the pre-survey and the pre-assessment. Then students were provided links to supplemental videos, which were interviews of, uh, with different health professionals, a roles and responsibilities document, which housed um, the profession's scope of practice across the different countries that were participating and the actual case study document. Um, the video for the standardized patient, which I just discussed was also in this section, as well as some questions for the students to review while they were watching so that way they can bring it and discuss it with their, their interprofessional groups on the day of the event. Um, at the bottom of the web page was just some post surveys and post assessment uh, and also the ICAS and IPAS uh, surveys. And a facilitator's guide was also developed to assist in the training of the facilitators so that the discussions were productive and all participants had similar experiences. Next slide. Um, so this is a picture of one of the breakout rooms on the actual day of the event. So the synchronous portion of the event, um, we started the day um, 
facilitators joined 20 minutes early and went over some like last minute uh, details. Um, and then students were let in uh, from the waiting room at the start of the event. The committee did brief introductions. They gave a layout of the proceedings for the, the day and then um, the video was played. So while all of this was happening, the Zoom host was um, cre uh, started creating all the breakout rooms, uploaded the 200 pre-sorted participants and then manually sorted the 200 remaining participants. Uh, this was a little laborious because all 400 participants had to be sorted into specific breakout groups so that each interprofessional group had a well balance um, of professions. Um, it just couldn't be random. And then once the breakout rooms were open, students introduced themselves, stating their name, profession, and where they were from. They discussed the case and then they discussed the case for about an hour. Um, after that, the breakout rooms were closed and everyone joined back into the main room where several groups shared their biggest takeaway. And Erin. My name is Erin Sapio. I was a committee member from the counseling program at Stockton University. We took a problem-based learning approach to this project in order to facilitate the collaborative learning experience of the participants. We had 399 participants from 27 universities. In our case, students participating in this AFRIVIPE had the opportunity to read the scenario as well as watch a video recording of the simulated patient in advance of the event. This advanced consideration afforded the students the opportunity to consider the myriad of physical, psychological, and social aspects of the patient's life that needed attention. Faculty facilitators were additionally given a facilitator's guide which outlined the questions they should ask their small groups during the event to promote curiosity and discussion. In the event the students spoke in these interprofessional small groups, we had a total of 29 interprofessional groups consisting of 10 to 12 students per group. And the problem-based approach gave the students the authentic experience of offering their professional knowledge within their content area, as well as learning about the professional perspectives when treatment planning. Okay. And so um, just to say that we uh, started off in Africa with the, we started off in the United States and then we moved to Africa, but then other universities heard about what we were doing and other organizations heard about what we were doing. So in turn, we ended up having 14 different countries uh, join us and a, a list of several different universities that you will see here that we included from everywhere from um, South Sudan to Canada um, to, to Malaysia. Uh, and then I will hand it over to Esmeralda. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Esmeralda Ricks, and I'm an emeritus professor at Nelson Mandela University in Port Elizabeth, South Africa. So I will be sharing some qualitative results since the quantitative results are still pending for APRIVAI. So the students in this current study was uh, requested to list some key highlights that contributed to their learning from and with each other. So overall, the students reported that they enjoyed the process and meeting and interacting with other students from other professions and countries. Students stated that they experienced the exercise as very meaningful since they got to learn about each other's professions and how each profession approached the patient. The case study highlighted the need for and the importance of interprofessional collaboration, which gave rise to vibrant discussions in the different groups, which the students found energizing and informative. The students indicated that this experience made them realize that working together is essential for the best patient care, since working together as a team provided them an opportunity to view the patient holistically since all students were given an opportunity to contribute to the type of intervention required by the patient. This they found to be productive and effective. And in closing, they also indicated that they enjoyed the diversity of cultures and learning about similarities and differences. Andy. So with just a few seconds left, um, I just want to talk about some of the lessons we've learned. Um, first off, this really was a remarkable interinstitutional 
international and interprofessional collaboration, just to bring together this many experts from this many corners of the globe, from this many different institutions to build this case, to bring it forward for our students and what it meant for students training in these different disciplines and variants of those disciplines in different countries um, for this activity was a really meaningful experience that each of our students got something really unique out of. Um, at the end of the day, it really takes a dedicated team. Again, this is a sweat equity effort where all of us have given a little bit of ourselves, our expertise, and just, I, you know, it's the thing about those that get involved with interprofessional edu education is that they are just natural collaborators. So I find time and time again that when I get to work with these different bike groups that we form, that I just treasure the relationships and the collaboration, the product that comes out, and it shows in the student outcomes as well. Um, IT logistics, as, as Renee covered in, in good detail, um, are, are a big challenge. Um, and it's something that you need to consider before trying to put on an event at this scale. And at the end of the day, I think the big finding that we have from all these different VIPE activities is that meaningful interprofessional interaction can be achieved between students in this virtual online format. Thanks. Yes. And thank you. And just to add to that real quick, um, we had students who, uh, medical students who were returning from China, from, their, uh, from Africa to study, and they uh, were back in the, we had to get them in computer labs. And due to COVID, we had to make sure to make separate separations and have uh, protections. Um, and also, if you don't have a standardized uh, patient uh, expertise at your university. Hanley had an amazing one. And so we were able to partner with them and they were able, able to film on the ground, which was an amazing experience. So that was excellent. So thank you for this experience. My name's Ricky Ellis, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today um, about our study, which has found that performance at medical school does predict success in the MRCS and how we can use that information. First, a little background about the MRCS. The MRCS is a high stakes postgraduate surgical examination. It's taken by more than 6,000 surgeons annually. So it's a, a very large assessment. Success is mandatory for all UK surgical trainees in order for them to progress into their higher specialist training. And it therefore acts as a bit of a safeguard for patients, making sure that all higher specialty trainees, i.e. registrars or, or residents, um, have met a standardised assessment of their knowledge and their skills. The MRCS is broken down into two parts. Part A, a five hour multiple choice questionnaire written examination, and part B, a three and a half hour clinical examination, uh, which is comprised of 18 uh, OSCE stations. Like I say, it's a high stakes examination for a number of reasons. Uh, firstly, it enables career progression, but also there's a high personal financial cost to, to sit in the examination. It takes most trainees months, sometimes years, to pass both parts of the examination. And trainees are not given any extra study time um, around their clinical uh, work. Therefore, they're spending their time off duty, their evenings, their weekends, studying for the examinations. And this obviously comes at a cost uh, to their work-life balance, their family lives, etc. There's also a significant financial cost. It costs approximately £1,500 just to sit the examinations, and many do not pass the exams at their first attempt. Most students will also spend hundreds, if not thousands of pounds on revision uh, resources in the run-up to the exams. So you can understand why it's so important for us to identify factors that can predict success in these exams. But I would argue it's more important that we identify factors that predict failure so that we can redistribute resources and support to those who will benefit from it the most. In order to justify the significant value placed on this examination within surgical training, we need to know that the exam can discriminate between candidates based on their ability. What do I mean by ability? Well, I mean their knowledge, their skill and the clinical application of these. We also need to understand its predictive validity. Uh, after all, a, a test would not be fit for purpose if it does not predict later success. We know that medical school performance predicts performance within foundation training, but we don't know much else about how it predicts performance in postgraduate training. <clears throat> Excuse me. Here's a brief overview of surgical training in the United Kingdom. 
students when they finish uh, high school will take uh, exit exams called A-levels or an equivalent exam. They will also sit a medical school admissions test such as the UCAP, BMAT or GAMSAT examinations. And these scores are combined with an interview score uh, when being selected for medical school. After medical school, doctors will start their training uh, as a foundation training. Uh, entry to foundation training is a competitive selection and we'll talk about this in a moment. From foundation training, uh, budding surgeons will apply for a, a core surgical training post, uh, which is a couple of years. Um, that is again a, a competitive uh, selection. And during their core surgical training, they'll take their MRCS examinations. If they pass, successfully pass the MRCS examinations and a number of appraisals, they can apply to enter higher specialist training or residency training. Again, this is competitive selection. It's highly competitive. And it's quite a bottleneck in training programs. During their higher specialist training, they'll take exit examinations. So the fellowship of the Royal College of Surgeons examinations. Successful completion of these is compulsory before progressing on to being a consultant. Today, we're gonna to focus on the EPM and the SJT. But what do we know so far? We know that success at first attempt of the MRCS part A predicts success at the first attempt of the MRCS part B. So there's a degree of internal predictive validity there. We also know that success at first attempt of the MRCS part A can predict performance in a candidate's exit examinations five or six years later down the line. We know that those entering more competitive higher specialist training posts perform better at their MRCS and those that pass their MRCS at first attempt actually increase their likelihood of, of getting into higher specialist training at first attempt despite MRCS scores not being used for selection. So that's looking forwards. Now if we look backwards we know that high school exit uh, sorry those that pass MRCS at first attempt actually perform better in their high school exit examinations and their medical school uh, admissions tests. So really by studying the EPM and the SJT, i.e. medical school performance and foundation training selection tools and whether they can predict uh, performance at the MRCS, rounds off the predictive validity of this high stakes examination. How do we measure performance at medical school? Well, we, unfortunately, we don't have a medical licensing assessment um, in the United Kingdom, unlike, for example, in the United States. This is due to be uh, imposed in the UK, but at the moment we use uh, two scores, first of which is called the Educational Performance Measure. This is a programmatic assessment where candidates or, or medical school graduates are awarded up to 43 points, depending on which decile um, they fall into at the end of their medical training. They also are awarded a few extra points for additional degrees, for example, if you've taken an undergraduate science degree before uh, studying medicine, and there's a couple of points up for grabs if you've published uh, any peer-reviewed papers as well. This score out of 50 is added to a score out of 50 awarded for performance on the situational judgment test. This is not a knowledge-based assessment, but a, a test that looks at the attitudes, behaviors, and beliefs expected of day one junior doctors. These two scores out of 50 are added together to give a total UK foundation program selection score of 100. All UK medical graduates are uh, ranked using this score out of 100 uh, for foundation program selection. So what did we do? We looked at all UK graduates, who attempted the MRCS between 2013 and 2017. That was over 1900 graduates. We compared information in the newly created MRCS database with information collected in the UK Medical Education Database. And we looked at first attempt performance. First attempt scores have been found to be the most predictive uh, factor in later success in postgraduate examinations. And what did we find? Well, we found that candidates who passed the MRCS at first attempt scored higher in their educational performance measure, their decile, their degree points, their publication scores, and their SJT scores. We also found st statistically significant correlation between 
the performance in medical school and performance on part A, the written examination paper. This was, speci this was specifically um, uh, significant for the EPM and the EPM decile, less so for points awarded for degrees and for publications and in the situation of judgment test. We also found some worrying uh, sociodemographic uh, predictors of MRCS success. We found that there were statistically significant differences in pass rates between students who sat or that undertook their medical degree as an undergraduate versus a postgraduate, with undergraduate students performing significantly better. Similarly, we found white candidates perform significantly better than non-white candidates. And we found that males perform significantly better in part A of the examination than females, that there was no statistically significant difference in, by gender for part B of the examination. We created logistic regression models, adjusting for these sociodemographic predictors of success. And we found that for every additional decile point that a candidate or a medical school graduate achieves, they increase their chances of passing the MRCS by 52%, which is a staggering number. They also increase the chance of passing the MRCS part B by 27%. For each extra point awarded for extra degrees prior to undertaking medicine, they increase their chances of passing the MRCS part A by nearly 30%. We found that points awarded for publications and also for the SJT were not statistically significant independent predictors of MRCS success. So to summarize, this was the first study that investigated the relationship between UK medical school performance and foundation selection tools with postgraduate exam success. We found that students that leave medical school or enter foundation tr uh, training that are ranked higher than their peers are more likely to succeed in the MRCS. Which means that firstly, the road to success for those wishing to pursue a career in surgery at the moment starts very early in your career. But also we now know that we can use foundation program selection assessment scores to identify candidates that would likely benefit from more support in postgraduate training. Additionally, we can say that the educational performance measure works. Medical schools are successfully managing to, to measure the performance of across multiple programmatic assessments. Um, and this ties in with the academic backbone theory, i.e. prior academic attainment is the best predictor of future success. These results are particularly timely given the recent changes to foundation training selection, whereby they're going to remove points awarded for degrees and publication scores. And in this study, both degrees and publication scores have far less predictive value than uh, deciles, but they do still uh, have a function by increasing the spread of, of candidates. Interestingly, the situational judgment test was not found to predict later success, though this wasn't entirely surprising given that, as I said earlier, it's not a test of knowledge, it is a test of personal attitudes, traits, uh, and behaviors expected of junior doctors. The weak correlation seen between uh, the SJT scores and the MRCS Part A scores is likely because both exams are mapped to the General Medical Council's Good Medical Practice Guide. So they're both measuring a degree of professionalism. And the SJT does offer a degree of incremental predictive validity um, it, because it can predict uh, foundation program performance and it does increase the spread of candidates. So it does serve its purpose in that regard. So in terms of future work, there's many other variables to account for um, what underpins success in postgraduate training and in the MRCS. For example, what impact does medical school have or, or pedagogy or curriculum changes? Does training location, for your surgical training have a significant impact or high school that you attended? 
does it matter how many resources you use in the, the run up to your examinations or your financial commitment to them? And equally, we've now identified a way of, of um, reallocating resources to those who need it the most. But what resources do we allocate? Is it more teaching time, more training? Is it more study time or more, stu more time in theatres? Is it more time protected for revision? And lastly, as I said earlier, we did identify worrying group level attainment differences, and these do need urgent investigation. They're by no means exclusive to the MRCS and have been seen in other postgraduate assessments in the FRCS, as we spoke about earlier, um, in the postgraduate assessments in the UK for GPs, for physicians, as well as in the USMLE used in the United States. Further analysis with differential item functioning uh, could help to rule out systematic bias or uh, discrimination within the questioning, um, and that needs to be done urgently. So thank you very much for listening. Uh, I'd be more than happy to uh, take any questions that you have. And lastly, thank you to all the four Royal Colleges of Surgeons uh, in the UK and Ireland for supporting the research. Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you uh, for the other panelists for two such great talks. Um, I'm Julie Brown from Cardiff University, and I'm here representing um, my uh, co-presenters, uh, Alison Bullock, Derek Gallen, and John Jenkins. Um, we want to talk about a project that we've been doing on um, the uh, values and activities of healthcare um, professionals and the implications of that for interprofessional education. And I think the AFRI VIPE report rather um, uh, will uh, explain uh, some of the um, interest that we have in this topic and, and uh, I'll, I'll explain more as we go. Uh, to begin with, uh, I expect this uh, is a slide that's been shown a lot during this conference, uh, the definition of interprofessional education. Um, but I would like us to look at it um, from uh, the teacher's perspective. Interprofessional education requires two or more professions to learn with, from and about each other. That requires quite skillful education management and educational um, insights. This is because obviously uh, active experimental social learning is actually baked into that concept. You can't learn with, from and about each other unless you are learning as equal adults in an active setting. Um, but what we ask is the place of the teacher and the teaching team. Um, this is a conceptual module a model from our, our forthcoming book, but um, I'll talk you through it uh, gently to explain uh, where we're coming from with this. This is often how education is addressed within the literature. Um, we, we see it all the time, and as interprofessional educators, we kind of notice it as well, that education is often conceived as the transmission of information from an educator in profession A, say a nurse or a doctor, to a learner in profession A a nurse or a doctor. Uh, I've oversimplified this model a little bit because obviously uh, it, it reflects a transmission model where we know that in fact education generally involves learners and educators communicating together and that the teachers often do as much learning as the students do but um, bear with me um, with this simplified model. So this is how education is often conceived. As interprofessional educators however we know already that it it's a bit more complicated than that. And in many environments, this is what interprofessional education actually looks more like. So you have an educator from profession A teaching uh, learners from uh, group A and group B. Now, educator A and learner A are still uh, comfortable with each other. Um, the educator has been a learner. They know what uh, the learners in group A need. They understand the regulatory um, requirements, they understand the curriculum. Um, they have to, however, uh, accommodate the fact that there are learners from another group in their, uh, in their session. And um, these are learners with whom they may not share a professional background. So they have to reach out to them carefully and, and make sure that 
um, the learners in Group B feel that they're getting a similar educational value from the um, from the event as as the learners in Group A, and they need to feel that that um, their contribution is is equal and valued. The other challenge for an interprofessional educator here is that they've got to manage the communication between the learners in Group A and Group B. Um, many of us, I think, will have looked at, uh, have taught in interprofessional groups where you actually have a bit of a challenge because the individual interprofessional groups tend to kind of clump together in a classroom and trying to get them to, to interact normally and, and respectfully can be a challenge for an educator. So um, this is up to the stakes slightly. But this is often what interprofessional education looks like in practice. This is what it really should be looking like in theory. And this very much reflects, I think, what the AFRI VIPE people were, were showing. It's a tremendously complex environment now. We have educators from three, in this case, different groups, uh, teaching learners from three different groups. And um, all of the issues that were just outlined in the previous model suddenly become extremely complex for, for the educators. Um, you have uh, educator A who's still got their faithful students from group A, but um, educator A is having now to cope with two different other educators from other backgrounds. And um, pity poor educator C who has no students in the room with which they share a professional background. Similarly, if you look at the learners in group D, they also have no educator in the room with whom they share a professional background. And so some of their understandings and expectations about what their learning is going to be like are going to be challenged. So this produces a very complex environment. And this is the environment in which we as interprofessional educators have to teach. Now, again, a lot of the literature on interprofessional education focuses on the outputs for the learners. And uh, you see plenty of guidelines explaining what the outputs of interprofessional education should be like in terms of team building among the learners. But I would ask, what about the educators? How can they be encouraged to see themselves as an educational team? Uh, what happens to their professional identity as they're uh, attempting to um, manage this very complex situation? The issue is obvious one for team competence because we know from the literature that outstanding individuals may be marvelous at teaching within their own professional group. They may be uh, wonderful at teaching their own students, but they may actually be ineffective in uh, interprofessional teams because of things like vertical hierarchical differences, which will place um, senior members of the team and usually doctors at the top and horizontal issues, which um, can often uh, lead to mistrust between professional groups. How do we overcome these barriers? A good question. I'd like to take you back to the origins of our work, which was around about 2017. Um, nine organizations within healthcare education uh, discussed whether they could collaborate more closely together and project, pr perhaps produce a federation of healthcare education organizations where they could work together to, to um, promote interprofessional contacts between their groups. There was a lot of goodwill on all sides, but there was skepticism from many who reported those vertical and horizontal challenges that they did. They feared that um, one professional group would take over at the expense of everybody else, that groups would not work together because of traditional tribalism, um, that it, it just couldn't be done. And one of the issues was very much, well, who do we, how can we identify what we have in common then to, to create such a collaborative organization? How do we know that, that dental educators and nurse educators even share the same understandings about education? So we, as a group, um, came to the conclusion that one way forward might well be to establish a consensus about all those values and activities through which all healthcare educators could recognize themselves as part of a bigger team, the, the team of healthcare educators rather than uh, nurse educators or doctor educators. So this was the work which, um, uh, this was the ideology, if you like, or the, the, the evidence which 
propelled us to do the piece of work which I want to report now. So um, the HEVAR project, we called it the HEVAR project, meaning healthcare educators, values and activities, because that was basically what we were trying to do, is to see what it was that healthcare educators both valued um, in their personal lives and also in their activities as, as uh, working teachers. It was a five phase process. Um, first of all, it involved the analysis of 48 different frameworks, guidelines and standards from 27 different professions to see what it was that all of those documents shared. The end result of this uh, lengthy process, which took place throughout the whole of 2019, um, led us to produce nine core values and 25 activities, which we grouped into domains. Um, and uh, we were confident that these were the nine core values and 25 activities that all uh, healthcare educators, regardless of their profession, would recognise as reflecting their work. Uh, we feel that it was the first really genuinely multi-professional consensus statement on the basic values that we all share. Um, and uh, at this stage, I want to give thanks to um, Health Education England and Health uh, Education and Improvement Wales for their funding of this project. This is a very detailed slide and I apologise. Uh, anybody who wants to see a copy of the, of the final framework document is most welcome to contact us. You'll have our emails at the end. Um, but we wanted to show that the, um, th this is the final uh, framework as it, um, as it uh, was printed. So it begins with preparation for teaching. It moves through teaching and supporting learning uh, to learner progression and assessment and finally to quality. Um, this is a sort of natural plan, do, study, act cycle. Um, and right at the centre, of course, are the values which the educators share. Where we are now? Um, well, we've piloted it and validated it with a group of educators from the Pan London Educational Alliance, which show that using it as a, as a way of designing educational interventions um, works and that it's valid, acceptable and useful and it could be feasible. Um, as a large scale uh, uh, document framework. We've got a book and a paper forthcoming and um, we're also undertaking a professional standards authority review on the effects of regulation, um, which uh, reveal that the literature itself is quite, quite poor, a poor quality and rather small scale and distributed. Um, and this is also informing our future work. What are we going to do next? Well, we're taking it out to wider consultation, uh, particularly interested in the views of allied health professionals and junior educators. Um, we're also going to look in more detail at the activities and values of all the educational supervisors um, that are actually operationalizing improvement. Um, and here I'm mentioning COVID in particular, um, where the role of the interprofessional educator has really come into its own. Um, we're also doing a literature review with the General Medical Council, um, to look at ways in which uh, health and social care professionals can be better supported to work effectively together through regulation. And um, our hopes are that in the future, we will also be exploring and reporting on um, the values of the more senior educators and education leaders. We're interested particularly in what it is that specialist educators, such as clinical skills teachers, who often work interprofessionally, um, what it is that they have in common. And we're also interested particularly in the values and activities of interprofessional educators and senior interprofessional education leaders who are, we think, uh, an under-recognised, under-appreciated group within healthcare education. Uh, thank you very much. These are our contact details and we obviously we'll be taking questions at the end. Thanks to, uh, to Adam. <laughs>
So I was apprehensive, but also eager to share, eager to learn and find out all of the new things that university had to offer. As you can see, my healthcare journey is in its infancy and I came into the degree programme with limited caring experience. When I think about how care was delivered, I hadn't really considered the involvement of other disciplines beyond nursing itself. Needless to say, I very quickly experienced a, a steep learning curve. My first experience of IPE took place at the end of my very first week as a student, and it certainly challenged my comfort zone as well as my perceptions. Engaging all of the first year students within the School of Healthcare Sciences meant that there was a pool of over 750 students across nine disciplines. Here's me trying to contend with my own nerves and anxieties about re-entering education, working online, and this originally large pool of nursing students surrounding me has just become a giant ocean. How does this work? What is IPE? How do I get my voice heard? And this is where my appreciation for the complexity of care begins. My initial fears and worries about the IP induction event were allayed a little bit when I realised that the 750 students had been split into three groups, so slightly less students to contend with, and the induction itself was split into two sections. There was an initial keynote about IP at Cardiff, followed by a group activity. The keynote lecture began to build my understanding of IPE and it provided context for learning in this way. I began to understand the reason IP was included within the curriculum and the need to develop working relationships during education that can then be continued and strengthened in practice. The newfound knowledge resonates well with the World Health Organization's vision of IPE as a stepping stone to collaboratively ready practice. This had a dramatic effect on my developing idea of care. Suddenly, caring for the patient began to take on a whole new meaning. It opened up new learning opportunities for me on an individual level. Who else might I work with? And what role would they play in caring for our patient? More importantly, how would I be supported in developing these skills, these collaborative skills that suddenly seem so essential for practice? IPE within the School of Healthcare Sciences at Cardiff University uses a shared outcomes approach. This means that all of the undergraduate programmes have IPE outcomes which are mapped across individual modules. The exception is midwifery, but this discipline will adopt the same approach with the future midwife curriculum. Now, each level of learning has different shared IPE outcomes that build from the learning already undertaken. So the IPE outcomes are reinforced through interactive activities, which then enhance modular learning and are supported by the IPE facilitators. IPE formative assessment will be linked to summative and will also be about developing yourself and CPD. Summative assessment will be within the programmes where IPE learning outcomes are placed. We are encouraged to develop links with other professional groups within the School of Healthcare Sciences and within the wider university setting. At level four, the focus is on students developing a sense of self within practice boundaries. It explores an opportunity for professionalism, team working, codes of practice to be explored and shared. I'll explain a little more about my self development as a consequence of IPE shortly. At level five, the focus is on the wider team and uh, that has a, any role within the patient pathway. And thinking ahead to this, I'd like to be able to explore how I can interact with those wider teams and how that interaction is going to impact on patient care. To me right now, level six seems a very distant prospect, but I suspect this will be upon me very quickly. IP at level six focuses on collaboration how we work together to solve real world problems. This will draw on all of the skills and knowledge that I've developed during the other levels of learning. Now the group activity itself was not healthcare related, but instead encouraged us to work together as a group to design a pitch for a randomly chosen event. 
from a randomly chosen venue. I think we had a little spinny wheel on the screen that, that helped us choose. And um, the group we had to pitch in with had a Halloween event at Von Mon Castle. Now, um, obviously, that I had some uh, uh, initial sceptical views on the activity and how much help it would actually be. But as we began to discuss our thoughts and ideas, my confidence grew. Reflecting back on the experience uh, for this presentation, I believe that the activity took the focus away from being on healthcare where I lacked experience and I lacked knowledge. Um, and I was able to relate real life experiences and draw on those to help shape and focus ideas and then gave me the confidence to share and interact with the group. For me, I definitely felt getting to know each other in this manner, there was a sense of team building. Subsequently, I'd like to think I'd be more confident to approach those students from the other disciplines if I needed to know more about their profession. As I move forward into my first clinical placement, I can see how this would have a direct impact on the care I'm able to provide and how it will offer me a better understanding of the patient pathway. Listening to the thoughts and ideas of the other group members led me to reflect on different perspectives to the same problem and how this could influence the healthcare that we deliver. Initially, there were lots of ideas shared. Appreciating how we made decisions together and resolved conflict has been an important step in my self-development. Although I appreciate I've only just scratched the surface and there is lots more to learn. Having this initial experience has provided me with the motivation to explore these issues for myself and maybe share my findings with peers on the adult nursing programme or with the wider IP group that I work with. Indeed, we've actually shared um, a WhatsApp group to try and stay in touch with each other and um, do the bid to uh, ultimately build in those relationships for future use. Now, through my profession specific learning, I'm gaining a greater knowledge and understanding of how IPE and the wider interprofessional working agenda is intrinsically linked to the nursing and midwifery code. Under the section titled Practice Effectively, the code provides clear guidance on the need for nurses to work collaboratively with each other and with other professions. Further guidance on Standard 8 highlights the needs for me as a nurse to maintain effective communication with my colleagues whilst respecting their knowledge and skills to make appropriate referrals. This highlights to me the continued need to actively engage in the IP activities offered at university so I can continue to develop my own knowledge of other professions to help me work alongside and that may be part of my patient's future pathways. Following on from this, as part of the NMC code, there is an onus on me as a nurse to work with colleagues to evaluate both my own practice and the work of the team. Looking at level five of our IP curriculum, I can begin to see how the skills developed during the IP activities will help me fulfill this standard in practice. Standard nine of the code also builds on the need for a qualified nurse to be able to deal with differences in professional opinions through discussion and informed debate, respecting the views of others. Again, I can appreciate the role that IPE will play in helping me develop these skills. Understanding how this can be linked to practice became much clearer to me following a care planning task that was set within our profession specific modules. The task made me consider the patient journey and my role within that. In considering this, I became acutely aware that the patient has needs that go beyond the role of the nurse and that I need to engage with a far wider proportion of the healthcare arena than can be offered even within the School of Healthcare Sciences. Healthcare practitioners, speech and language therapists, nutritionalists and many others may also be required to meet the needs of my patients. I can clearly see how IP can help me gain a better knowledge an understanding of roles of other professionals. I'll be better suited to signpost the patient and ensure that their needs are being met. Now, I appreciate that my IP journey is still very much in its infancy and there's still so much for me to learn. But through the activities I've engaged with the curriculum so far, 
and the opportunity that given this presentation has afforded me, I have already developed my ideas of the healthcare team. I appreciate that a patient journey encompasses a wide variety of healthcare professionals and that we have to work closely and collaboratively to ensure that the patient experience is one of coordinated care and of compassion. I have started to broaden my own horizons in terms of practitioners that I may interact with whilst caring for my patients. As I embark on my first clinical placement in the next fortnight, I'm looking forward to discovering other groups and filling in the blanks that you can still see evident on this slide. I look forward to the inevitable challenges that IPE and interprofessional working will bring to my own growth and development as a result of this. Thank you all for listening. There's some references on screen as well.